I think a lot of people here are probably starting up their own venture for the first time. Uh, and having that support network, whether that's Accelerator or an incubator, uh, could be really valuable. So, so thanks to Bridge Billions uh, mm -hmm. for that. Um, so, so my background, uh, so I have an interesting background. I, I, I uh, have a foot both in the business and, and um, development sort of technical doors. I, I you know, went to school for business, um, but I've been coding all my life since I was a kid. Um, so you know, as I went to IBM, IBM, IBM Research, I started to develop a lot of those more coding skills, right? So as I moved into the entrepreneur world, um, and, and having looked at a couple of different areas, that experience is both, uh, it, was, it was incredibly useful, I think, uh, because it, it provides the insight both from the business acumen side, um, right? What is the right business model? Who is your customer? And being able to get the marketing right, as well as kind of the technical understanding of what I try to tell people who don't have technical backgrounds, but strong business backgrounds is uh, you should understand what's valuable and easy and valuable and hard, and then not valuable and easy, not valuable and hard. Because I think it's easy as a business person to say, oh, I really want this thing. But having technical understanding of kind of the technical debt and cost it takes is really valuable as well. Um, so long story short, I've worked on a couple different areas, one around healthcare AI. Um, the earlier version of what I'm doing now was what I incubated through the Bridge for Billions program. Um, looking at how do you help uh, entrepreneurs with cash flow, or how do you help small businesses with cash flow, and transitioning now into how do you specifically get freelancers paid on time. Um, so that was a little bit of the long story. I'll, I'll hand it off to Pablo or, or to, to Alexandra to, to talk more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. Can I ask you, Pablo, to a little introduce yourself as well and explain what you're doing also with, with Rx right now so we can have this, uh, this intro, let's say. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, first of all, great to be here. I mean, it's um, great to see how like we've gone sort of from user to actually uh, become a part of someone that uh, can actually help the other guys here, which is very exciting. Uh, I think I'll resonate with with Ryan and kind of what you said as well is that it's pretty lonely uh, setting up businesses and, and becoming an entrepreneur. So, uh, this is my first startup. Um, before this, I was in uh, an investment bank in London uh, for just over five years where I met my co-founder, Miguel. Um, and so what we're trying to do at uh, Addicts was we, and I think this is kind of right up Bridge for Billions' alley of what you guys help uh, do in your, in your value proposition is we went from a very grand and like idealistic vision uh, to actually go on and create something that uh, is very tangible and that can actually be, a, be applied in the real world. So what we're hoping to do is to basically digitalize the real estate transaction. So right now, um, real estate is one of the few things that everyone in their lives at some point deal with, be it through like a lease or, or actually buying your own house uh, and it's something uh, quite emotional and at times irrational. And the fact that it's all offline and sort of with you're dealing with a lot of different counterparties and stuff makes it very, very complicated and confusing and also daunting. So we've gone sort of a lot of focus on the UX UI uh, of this kind of thing and really focused on tech as an enabler uh, to take something that was very old and that hadn't been innovated in a very, very long time uh, uh, to try and make it uh, easy and efficient for everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you much, Pablo. Uh, I will actually go back to that because I find very interesting how you're, you're presenting innovation, you're presenting um, a solution for the market. And still I know, and I've heard that you found constraints uh, when you first log in and the reaction from the investors. Etc. So I will definitely uh, okay. ask you a little bit about that later. So maybe we can, we can pick from here. And because you were both in different geographies when you started, uh, Pablo, correct me, you were in Europe uh, when, you, yeah. when you started with Addicts. Yeah. So the company was, in, I mean, we, we set up in, in Spain and Madrid. Mm -hmm. um, I was working from London most of the time, uh, and Miguel was sort of in Madrid, but also all around Europe. And now, actually, we are in Toronto, where we're moving yeah. the company. Sorry, I did say New York. I'm sorry, <laughs> I thought you were. Yeah, I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, corrected. Great. So, but but it's interesting because you did start in, in different, completely different geographies, even though if you're starting. In now and and you have that ecosystem experience as well um i'm sure you've learned a lot uh, in your path and and i wanted to start here because there are so many different types of funding when you're starting you're also trying to understand um what is the profile and the sources of funding that you can count with if you can if you're going to if you're going to count with yourself with crowdfunding with business angels what kind of venture capitals or 
different stage uh, investments, uh, awards, competition, bootstrapping your way up. So um, at what point did you decide that you really wanted to seek for investment, external investment? And um, what was this moment for you? And when was this obvious? What did, what did make you take this decision? Maybe we can start uh, with Pablo since you were speaking and then I would love to hear Ryan's perspective of a different ecosystem um, and, and different, st different times when you launched your ventures. Yeah, sure. So I'll try to make it as interesting and not as scary at all. It was very scary. Um, so, I mean, you, you touched upon sort of competitions and, and sort of bootstrapping, and, and that's sort of exactly how we started. So uh, Miguel and I were working together, and uh, we were very into tech, um, but we weren't really in, in real estate. And sort of kind of serendipitously, we entered a, a prop tech competition, and we won. And so that, I guess, was our first injection of sort of um, both funds and uh, resources, but also validation that we could actually be onto something. Um, so we used like all the all the earnings from that competition on starting the company. And I guess that the moment to answer your question, when did we start looking for investment? Um, I mean, I'd say from from moment zero. I mean, one of the main lessons uh, that I think um, I've I've learned is. Um, it's always easier to get resources when you have resources. Like if you go up to someone when you don't have anything uh, and no one wants to be the first investor, no one wants to be the first person to sort of voucher or validate your product. Um, so I guess my, I mean, and I'll answer in the form of advice and I guess this is what I would tell myself is as soon as you have anything, be it validation, product revenue or, or, or the first investment or commitment, that's the moment to start looking for more because that's the moment when it's going to be the easiest and when you're going to be able to, to get the fastest. And the entire question entirely is uh, sort of who do you target at that point? And the answer to that question will, will change. And there it's more important, the hardest thing you'll do, especially when you're sort of short of resources is being able to say no. But um, it's very important that you actually find the right fit of investors, and we've had experiences with people who we thought would um, would be a great fit, and certainly turned out it wasn't. And uh, we said no, and kind of making our lives harder in, in the process because we had to basically rethink our whole sort of funding strategy. Uh, which comes to my next point: always have a plan B. Uh, but yeah, I'd say that you should always be looking for investment and investment taken in sort of in the broader sense of the word. That's really great, Ryan. Do you think that there's this kind of the right investment and a bad investment? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, certainly. You know, it's funny. I I haven't run into that sort of situation where someone's trying to hand me a check and it was a terrible check. So, you know, <laughs> I, I understand that is a very hard thing to turn down. But I, ha I mean, I have heard stories of that. You know, in, in course of our research, we were talking to a company who, um, you know, they were in an adjacent space uh, doing sort of uh, doing lending to companies and they got in with an investor who later turned out I think got arrested for fraud or, or investigated for fraud um, and they, you know they said look there are signs in the beginning we shouldn't have taken it but the the money was waving in our face and that that ultimately sunk us in the long run so uh, definitely be, be careful with that I, I think it's interesting it, it's an interesting question of who you go to and kind of what you're what your story is, depending on where you are in the cycle, and also your geography. Um, I, I think being in New York and, and sort of these big sort of investment regions, it makes it a little bit easier in some ways, because I think investors are a lot more tolerant of very early stage ideas. In fact, to the point where one investor I was talking to said, hey, you know, like maybe you want to raise money before you actually build anything because it's easier to raise money and tell this great story before kind of running into the reality of numbers. Now, I don't know if that's always a great idea, but it is a luxury that I have in, you know, New York to have that investors, investors take that sort of mindset. If you're coming from, say, Minneapolis, you know, a great city, but doesn't have the same sort of venture capital community, um, I, I'd probably recommend, especially if you're planning on being based out of there, to have a much stronger traction story to raise kind of more traditional sort of, to be, to be measured on sort of more traditional metrics of growth uh, before you seek that investment. Because I think it's a lot harder to come from a non um, VC ecosystem and try to raise very early. Were, were you, uh, Ryan, was it always obvious for you that you wanted to look for external investment? 
I think with the type of company I wanted to start, I think it, you know, some people want to be, create a lifestyle business, slow growing and sort of grow it over time. The types of business models I'm, I've been particularly interested in um, tend to be closer to marketplace models where it does make sense to grow really quickly. So I think it really depends on your business model and your, your you know, interests. For sure, for sure. Seg uh, the segment, your sector, um, culture awareness of your ecosystem, for sure. You can see that in your cases, you had a completely different experiences. Maybe you're also as an entrepreneur shaped uh, in a different way and you already tend to have different behaviors. Um, what about um, solo founders? I mean, you both had, um, you both had, uh, I think, Ryan, you had a co-founder as well, correct me? Mm -hmm. um, and, but you had different experience, but you, and you had, and you were for sure in competitions with our entrepreneurs. Uh, from your experience with the investors uh, and the first people you were talking to and your strategic partners, were you ever advised that this was something that was key uh, for investors? Um, it's, it's interesting. I actually was expecting to get that question a lot more than I did. Um, I, I think everyone talks about, you know, oh, oh have a co-founder, it's a lot more stable. Um, but what I think, and, and I would recommend it, right? If you have a strong co-founder who you, who, you know, you, you can work well with and has complementary skill set, absolutely do it. I think from, a, especially from a psychological perspective, it's, it's incredibly helpful. Um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't get a co-founder just to have a co-founder for investment. I, I think what investors are looking for, they keep talking about team. Um, and I think, you know, I was grateful, you know, I'm grateful to be able to have a little bit both of the, from a skill set perspective, both business and, and technical skills. And I think that checked a surprising number of boxes more than I was expecting. Um, Pablo, uh, you were too. Uh, you came from very similar backgrounds, right? You and Miguel. Um, was this something that was very present in your conversations? Uh, did you feel that this gave maybe another sort of uh, accountability perception, et cetera. How was this, um, uh, was this ever something that was put into the table with your conversation with investors when you were competing for, for sourcing for funding? Yeah, I mean, riffing off kind of what, what Ryan said, uh, especially at this stage of, of companies, um, team I think is 90% of the investment decision. And so, I mean, from a risk side of, from a risk perspective, having, co-founders that complement each other and have sort of a wide array of skill sets um, is, is a better investment that maybe just betting on one single guy. Uh, again, I think there have been success stories in, in both sides. Also, it, like, it's not our case, but I can imagine how co-founders can also add uh, an added layer of complexity in terms of if the roles aren't defined very well or if there's some sort of ego going on. Uh, again, it, it's all about the fit. Um, but I think also, I mean, uh, going going back to what Ryan said, um, for me it's been it's, it's been great, especially psychologically in terms. Because I said uh, when you start off, you, you there is a point when you are the only one that believes in this, and uh, having another person that also believes in this uh, is sort of makes things happen, and, and, and that's and that's always good. Um, there's something that you comment that you both commented in the beginning of, of course, uh, you're the, you're your first investor, and that's what also gives um, legitimates all the effort and asking someone else to also invest in, and help you launch your your businesses. Then we go for the family, fools, and friends, right? Uh, some people crowdfund, other people go directly to business angels or people that are close to them uh, that can maybe help them support at least to get you started, uh, get some traction maybe so that you can show to other investors what to just to showcase and to give examples to everyone here today. Um, what were the, the types of funding that you put into the table and that you have been uh, using or, or approaching uh, until now? The, pro the profile of, of investors, of funding? Yeah, so in, in our case, um, it's been so Fundraising in Spain is uh, very interesting, um, to put it mildly. Uh, there is very little, if no culture, um, of investing in early stage companies. And because of the type of company we were, uh, there was long distance or a long time until we could actually start generating revenue as a way of funding ourselves, right? We, we needed that first sort of push and, and research phase and consulting phase, and, and we needed the, the resources. Uh, we've like our first investor was an angel investor. 
Um, as of now, we haven't done a friends and family round just because we've always believed very strongly that we needed people that and we needed sort of smart money that would be able to help us at a later stage. So, and, and also as a way uh, sort of to get our message streamlined right from the start. So, um, I mean, there's, uh, I guess in Spain, there was a bit of a stigma of like, okay, so you raised money from your uncle. So, okay, fine. He, he, he basically invested in me because he, he had to. Um, why should I be the first sort of non uh, uh, sort of related investor you should have? Uh, in that sense, I think it depends on the region. Right now in Toronto, for example, uh, which is, is not New York, but we were in New York last week. Uh, I had people sort of just coming up to me and saying like, mm, I like you, let's, let's just find a way we can work together and, and invest or, or, or make a partnership or can I be a client? It's much more open and there's much more of a culture uh, about that. And then one of the things that um, one of our sort of mentors said is like people will uh, first uh, like you, trust you and invest in you in that order. So that's sort of uh, kind of, our, our kind of game plan and how we've approached the, the angel investor. And we're still, we have talks with VCs, uh, but again, um, you have to be very careful about what stage you are and what they will expect of you. And when raising money, it's very, you have to be very explicit about what milestones this money is gonna help you achieve because that's what people actually invest in. They don't invest in you for you to hire another developer or to, for you to move to a bigger office. They wanna see the traction that you have and make sure basically that you're true to your word and to my point that they can trust you. So I think that's, um, that's the way to kind of go about it, the, or at least the way we've done it. For, for sure. Um, Ryan, uh, I'm sure you have this other perspective of how it is to be in ecosystems that are very vibrant, they are already very, very fast and very competitive in terms of investment, they are used to this. Um, what is the, I, I wanted to go in this direction of knowing how much you should know about w when is the right moment to, 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 to look for investment because I know what I want to do with the money, how I want to scale with it. I know what to say, what I want to do with it, as, as Pablo was saying. Um, what are the main, your main uh, key advices for when are you ready to actually look for someone and say, so I want to raise capital because I want to invest in this and this and this to help me grow and achieve this and that? Yeah, when's the right when's the right moment to raise money? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on on who you're raising money from. And you know, to echo Pablo a little bit, you know, I, you know, I've had people who you know friends and family who say, hey, you know, tell me when you're raising money. I kind of want to invest. And I, you know, I've tended to be a little cautious because, you know, I think it's doable, but you have to really set expectations about where that money's going and the level of risk. Because I, I think a lot of sort of lay people are not. Uh, you know, they, they say, oh, I made an investment, I should get 6% later. Um, so, so setting those expectations can be huge and can get complicated when you have sort of friends and family involved. Um, to, to answer your question directly, when to raise, I, I think what you're saying is maybe from a VC or angel perspective. Um, I think the, one of the most important things is getting your story, is having a strong story and, and having a fit in terms of making sure that the market is right, um, that your team is is sort of uh, sellable, and that you believe in it yourself, and that you have enough validation internally to to be confident that this is what you're sticking with. Because um, interestingly, uh, at least for early stage conversations with with sort of institutional investors in New York, they don't seem super concerned. They've, they asked much less than I was expecting around traction. Um, they're not, you know, they didn't say, hey, oh, what's your user growth? The ones who do ask that tend to be ones fishing for information and pretend potentially not interested. Um, they tend to be, they tend to make sure that your story is strong, the market is strong, and the team is strong. So I, I would say look for those things in your own story for these vibrant ecosystems. Great, great. So let, let me just make you a quick question for both of you. Uh, how prepared were you when you, when you started? when you did your first pitch uh, for a competition from one to 10 with one being very underprepared or not prepared at all, let's say, and 10 super prepared. Ryan? Yeah, um, I, you know, you never feel like you're prepared enough. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I can answer that question from my own, uh, own psychology. I mean, I, I think there's always a sense you can do a little bit better. Um, but, but on the other hand, you know, when you tell a story to an audience, and the audience responds strongly, you also know that, okay, this story is working and there is definitely a feeling you get there. So um, from that perspective, uh, you know, 
you can tell when you're prepared. And I felt like I had a strong story. Pablo? Yeah, I mean, I from definitely... one to ten, the first sensation when you when you ended the first pitch and you had those questions after the pitch, what what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it was around a five, and then I sort of asked myself because we didn't throw up on stage, so I think that, that was a positive <laughs> thing. Um, but I think two things I would say is one, no two pitches are the same, just because uh, in this kind of company and and this sort of kind of projects they are ever evolving so it has to be a very dynamic message and also you have to I mean without going crazy about telling widely different stories you need to tailor it to your audience so it's not the same if you're speaking uh, like on the radio or if you're speaking to a VC that's specialized in your field right and and I guess one of the hardest things that we uh, that took us to learn was sort of less is more because at the beginning our first pitch was like okay so what do you guys do and I would be like okay do you have 45 minutes so I can tell you uh, and now I have and now I can basically like get it out in, in three minutes which is uh, definitely like uh, like you see a lot of people pitch and it looks like uh, it's like well it's like they were born with this no it's just hours and hours and hours of practicing and going back and forth so when you see people doing TED Talks and everything, there is a tremendous amount of work that goes into that. So it's just a question of putting in the practice. For sure. Uh, they do say there's this commonplace of thinking that the main reason why startups fail is mostly due to lack of preparation, anticipation, and, and a lot of self-care as well. Uh, but uh, for sure. So exactly going on that point of the learning curve, do you, can you identify a super strong aha moment um, on this, on this path of understanding, okay, so I should focus more on this or more on that, or I'm doing this wrong. Um, can you identify maybe a couple of, of those moments? Maybe Pablo, I'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, for us, like we are very sort of analytical in our approach to everything and kind of like very uh, high iteration and, and high learning in terms of A-B testing with our different pitches and different interactions. Uh, for us, the way we approach it is there were certain words or, or, or adjectives that we wanted to avoid people associating us with. So when people, like for us, it was, let's say, a failure. If um, we pissed and someone told us, well, it looks like you're not focused. Or it said, when someone says, mm, it looks like it's broad. Uh, so our goal was kind of like to remove those words from any sort of feedback. And I think our first aha moment was when we were able to sort of deliver a pitch um, in under five minutes. And people were like, okay, I get it. That was sort of the big sort of tears down your eyes, like they get it. <laughs> Ryan, I'll ask you the same. Yeah, um, I think it's it's pretty similar. It's around, you know, when you're talking to a potential customer and you know you've try you know you 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 feel like you have the direction right, and then suddenly you phrase it in a sort of concise, less is more way. And you see the customer's eyes or sort of the virtue, you know, you imagine that you, you, you feel them sort of lighting up and, oh, I have that problem. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think once you get that reaction out of people, you know, it may not be, you know, you may not have it perfect, but follow that thread because that, that is a big difference between something theoretical and people saying, yeah, that sounds cool for someone else in order to be, because everyone wants to be supportive versus, oh yeah, I have that pain point and they start telling a story in their own words. That's a big aha moment. For sure, so I'll just open maybe this a little bit to people who are joining today. Um, I have one question and then I'll ask people to just interrupt us and, and place their questions and we can have this conversation. Um, but Carlos um, sent this, this question before, so I'm gonna read it. I'm particularly interested in raising capital for social companies, especially uh, concerning low, no return on investments versus impact investments. Um, so uh, in your case, Pablo, you have, an impact um, related um, um, venture. Could you maybe give some insights on your experience on this, also considering what you've witnessed as well from others? Yeah, I mean, I'd say I have the same question. Uh, and we have a project that um, is actually more philanthropical than actually sort of return seeking. The way we've structured it is that uh, we have found a way to do it so we have a part which is sort of more closer to market and that we can monetize so we can actually fund that other part. Um, in that sense, I think um, the way to go is 
probably more towards business angels just because of the nature of the of the investor because VCs are going to be looking for returns and any point where you sort of don't guarantee them an ROI or, or an exit or whatever, they're going to just say no. So there I'd say the one thing that's key and we've had some success in that space is look at what problem you're tackling, look at who are the main advocates for that problem. And then from there, even if they're not the ones who are going to write you the check, if they see that you can solve their problem and it's kind of our experience and, and that you can have, you can add to it, they will already have a very strong network of people who could be able to write that check. And that's the way to sort of go about it. It's, I mean, it's not a great answer, I'd say, in terms of it's, it's very abstract and sort of it, there's a lot of derivatives. But, I mean, that's the way we've done it and we've had some success. No, for sure. So, uh, investors are people. Um, humans relate to humans, problems relate to pro problems. We were discussing just this just now uh, on the, on my, when, we were uh, when we were commenting on the pitch and what works and what doesn't work. So, people want to work with and want to invest in things that they believe in also as in a personal level. So, for sure, for, for purely impact ventures, this, this is an important note. We, as Bridge for Billions, also took that. Uh, that strategy, so so for sure, a uh, hundred percent aligned. Ryan, do you have any any comments? You also have have worked with projects, well, mainly also in healthcare, etc. So maybe more yes. comments. But what what would you have to to comment here? Well, you know, I think the healthcare world is particularly interesting because I think the one of the reasons I you know one big realization in that world is you know I'd focus for instance you know what I was working on is AI for patient adherence right can you get patients to take their medication etc and I you know I, you know this was the first you know venture I'd worked on and really early stage and I'd focus so much on patient outcomes that I kind of missed the bigger picture of the business model right the money isn't necessarily in patient outcomes in places like healthcare you need to figure out what is sort of the financial incentive for hospitals or insurance, et cetera. And that was a very different ballgame. Um, where I've seen social impact work, I mean, Bridge for Billions is a great example. I, I don't think I realized when I was in it that you, I, I don't think this is a secret, but you have a whole arm of, of um, companies you work with, um, corporations, universities who, who, who you know, uh, run this program. And the, come again? Strategic partners for us. Right. Um, and, you know, much of the uh, sort of the, you know, the program that I was running in as an individual is largely, I mean, it's much cheaper than it, than it is run. Uh, it is much cheaper than cost uh, because of that sort of corporate participation. Um, this is a, a random one, but uh, Queen of Raw is a company I was talking to who they do, um, they do waste recycling. So they'll take all the sort of excess materials from these big uh, fashion uh, producers and they'll resell it as sort of an Etsy market, but also between companies. And, you know, I was talking with them and saying, okay, are, are people buying this for the corporate social responsibility? She said, no, look, I, that's a great kind of uh, branding and a great impact we have as a result. But the reason people are interested in us company, you know, customers and investment is for, um, the corporation uh, for, for the, the profit potential here. Um, but the, so I will say the one exception I've seen is I have seen w at least one fund that they do want a profitable business model, but the metrics at which they invest, I think it's run by the Omidyars, um, Omidyar Farn, I think it's the Opportunity Fund. Uh, they do supply chain work, but their investment metric is how much impact can we have on supply chain traceability so there may be more of those sort of philanthropically funded funds um, that may fund you but i think they do want to see that you're sustainable from a profit perspective that's a great catch uh, for sure adapting your business model just as you're saying we also do that we create the program with corporates who then distribute it to beneficiaries that they want to target and this was a way uh, of achieving that as well and uh, alignment in terms of vision with your the investors you want to 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 reach for sure as Pablo was mentioning as well, and do your homework, uh, do research about the investors, uh, how what they look for, uh, fast check uh, who they are, what they are looking for. This is uh, getting also a part of getting prepared. I wanted to open the discussion to someone who's here. Maybe do you want to do someone? Anyone want to place a question, a comment? I see many familiar names here. Anyone for now? Maria? <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. Hello. Yeah, I have 
for for Pablo and then another question for Ryan actually. So for Pablo, um, I'm interested to know more about your experience uh, with investors in Spain because I'm actually in Spain and I'm in Valencia, but I'm not from Spain. So I don't know like, I mean, the, the culture I've been adapting, but especially like in, in terms of investing, what was your experience exactly? What Like what horror story do you have that was... Um, <laughs> That led you maybe to go to Toronto or something? I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't really a horror story, but we definitely didn't find our fairy tale uh, in Spain, uh, to put it a different way. Um, so again, I think going back to my comment on that the culture there is, is, is not really like, they really like sort of the, the tangible uh, business uh, they, when, they, uh, when they invest. So I mean, Spain, I think, is a great place and a great things to come out in the retail space. So you're in Valencia, so there's uh, the Lanzadera program, which is uh, very notorious and, and like a lot of great companies have come out of there. And actually, we had an experience with Lanzadera where we, because that was part of kind of like our prize where we would actually join their program. But then that was one of the hardest no's we have to say, like really, really at the beginning where they're like, okay, we'll invest in you guys and, and do all this stuff for you. But all their sort of know-how was in, in retail and sort of mass market manufacturing, that kind of thing. And it was really not what we needed to do. And it was, um, we were paying a high price to, to join and, and, and we had to say no. Um, another thing, especially with funds, is we will, we will, what we found is uh, a lot of people that we approached and were actually interested in the project said, okay, but this is the first investment that we're going to do in this stage or in this space. Uh, and so their way to compensate for that was that they wanted to be in the day-to-day -day of everything, having no knowledge on the, of, of the product or anything. And so, and, and that's, I mean, it, it sounds like, like not much, but having someone in there that has like skin in the game and that's also trying to tell you what to do can be mm. very uh, destructive for the company. And mm. I mean, we haven't gone through that, but we were advised by people who had that it was actually dangerous. So in that sense, I'd say like, brutal honesty is the way to go. Say like, look, you can go in, you can lose everything, um, or we, this can go great, uh, but don't expect to sort of, like keep the, the rules of engagement very clear. And that will be always a very good filter to uh, gosh, kind of like the fit of the investor to to your project. And and statistically, you will get more no's than, than yeses. And and our point, like our motto, was always you only need one yes, right? Uh, so again, be patient. Uh, it's tough because I mean, if, if it were easy, everyone everyone else will be doing it. Uh, and Spain, I mean. We think it's a, it's a great place. Uh, it's just the fit wasn't for us. And, and fortunately, we found our fit somewhere else. But I mean, best of luck with, with your project. And I mean, happy to discuss offline if, if you have any more specific questions. But, um, but yeah, that's sort of our experience. Yeah. So like setting your boundaries, like not being desperate and like saying yes to anyone, just like if it's not a fit, it's okay. It's Yeah, okay. exactly. And, and I mean, and also we, we're, we live in a global world, like go out there, go get an easy jet ticket to Berlin, go to Brussels, do stuff. Because people, especially in Europe, people will invest in, in things. People have, you don't, people don't say this, but uh, portfolio managers and NBCs have, they want to have very colorful portfolios and they want to have diversified risk. And because a lot of companies don't come out of Spain, for example, uh, you may be the, their missing slot and, and they've been very receptive hey it may not work for any other sorts of reasons but uh like don't assume that they won't speak to you just because you're based in spain because that's not true okay. like don't be shy and just go out there okay okay thank you and, yes, and then because you're also a marketplace and very your sector and your venture is a very niche uh, attractive uh, niche so for sure i would i would recommend you to keep going Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, my question is connected to that. So, yeah. So, Ryan, you mentioned something about marketplaces. Um, do you think all or, or most marketplaces should be funded? Or is there, like, a way that it could be bootstrapped? It depends like, on the thing? marketplace. So, so, do you want to tell me a little bit more? I, I don't know if we have time, Alexandra. Do you, have, oh, yes, do you want to explain a little more? That's perfect, yes. 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, to, to tell the, the, the story really quickly, it's, it's a marketplace like for the users so they can find and book their hair salons, their, their spas. And for the businesses, we help them go digital with like different tools and like automated tasks. So that's like the quick little story. And we're, we're here in, we're starting here in Valencia, like uh, in Spain, and then we want to go to Latin America. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Uh, should it be funded? I, I think you, you have to understand, you have to, you have to figure out what your capital requirements are and what growth trajectory you want to be on. Um, I, I think sort of the, the flip side of raising capital, you know, venture capital is that they're going to expect you to be doubling in size every X month, right? X number of months. And, and that's what sort of path you put yourself on, um, which not all markets and all business models are suited for. Um, but with that, with that said, if you wanted to raise venture capital, um, the two things I'd focus on are, you know, how can you sell, um, this is a big market, you know, this is a huge underserved market in Latin America or in, in, in you know, Spain um, that we are addressing. People spend X number of dollars on this and it's, you know, it's currently done over the phone. And then your story, you know, I grew up always in hair salons and, you know, and being able to fit yourself into that. Um, if you have both of those really strongly, it can totally be a candidate for, uh, for investment. Okay, but I, mean, quick. I, would add that if, I mean, sorry, if I mean, this seems like something that should be very appealing to the actual businesses. So I'm, I mean, I would suggest being very open with them and saying, like, I don't know what the funding request like needs are, but if they're, they're merged, we'll try and find a partner that will sort of fund you that's an actual hair salon, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a vehicle to attract other investment and knowledge and help you get there, for example. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> this is great. Um, anyone else? If not, or what do you think? I will also share a question that I have here from Sarita, who, I, who couldn't join today. Um, and this is a different, this is about MVPs. And what do we need to, to have when we are looking for, for funding or deciding in what kind of funding we wanna source. Um, for an app startup, what would be the minimum proof of concept you would present with a business plan and what, what form would it take? Yeah, so I, I can actually talk about this from also sort of having an engineering background. Um, having an engineering background actually can be a little dangerous because it's very tempting to want to overbuild things in the beginning. Um, and you can kind of substitute this app progress with the idea of sort of market progress. What I tend to tell people is actually focus on um, product, uh, sort of the, the sales fit, the marketing fit. Can you get people to want it? Because nobody actually, you know, I think people come into this, especially with apps saying like, oh, and then I'll show them the app and they'll get it. Nobody actually wants to look at your app until they want it. Um, so, so focus on, on getting people to want to look at it first and making, and making sure you have the engineering talent available to build it. Um, actually having a working prototype can be kind of a, a false goal to go towards. Yeah, I mean, I think the way we've we've gone about it, and and we're not in in the app space or from an engineering background, uh, is because you're gonna put all your eggs in that basket. Uh, I would resonate the, the the message of be extremely clear of what the key pain point is and what that is, and find that one feature, that one thing that will make it will help the most with it. It doesn't have to be the whole thing, but if you can get like if you it can be just proof that you are well on your way to solve the full problem. That'll be enough. And that's sort of what we've like our strategy so far. And, and we're like, we're launching our MVP next week. Um, and so far, I mean, our feedback has been positive in that sense. Congratulations, Pablo, on that as well. Uh, yes, so being agile as well, no? Now everyone is talking about it as well. Um, so really about listening to your clients, listening to your market, and understanding what is, as, as Pablo was saying, the key feature you're actually presenting, the key solution, and get something out there uh, and prove that uh, your solution, why you, why you want to build this and where you want to go with this, um, for sure. Uh, I really want to know, anyone else would like to place a question or I'll just move on. Uh, please do, inter do interrupt. Ah, Maria, you want, you want to say something? Ah. 
Sorry, I cannot hear you. I think Irati raised the... Oh, sorry. I didn't see it. So sorry. Irati. I was trying was to find yeah. it. I my hand when I couldn't. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm wondering, I am, well, I have a like, few ideas on investments and so, but uh, we do have an invest investor like with the story and the trust and all these things that we got the money. But for me now, the issue is like, Okay, so what is like the most important things to start with, or so, like to start investing in? Because like I think that mm, money can fly if you start like uh, doing lots of things together or at the same time. So how do you prioritize like where to start uh, putting that investment or so in, in the project? I think that's a great question actually, because this is the second phase. So now you have the money, you really want to use it very wisely. Uh, you have to take risks because you have to prove why you got the investment. Uh, but where are we going? When is it, where is it the right place to, to go with your, with your strategy and to what uh, speed? Anyone wants to jump in? Maybe Ryan, you, you had this experience before, so. Well, I, I mean, I guess the question for you is what's the next milestone you need to hit? Well, I need like the product, but at the same time, marketing and like the website. So these are like the three uh, things that should start like running. Yeah, I mean, I guess it, it depends on what your goal is, right? If your next sort of, you know, the, I guess the sub milestone is to make sure you have validation, then you'll probably want to pump uh, money into outreach and talking to users and, and that customer discovery. If you feel like you have the customer discovery down and you you have a bunch of people who want what you've described to them, um, the next thing is to get something in their hands to, to, to learn from that. Uh, so I guess it really depends on what your goal is between launching, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing, I, I mean, I'm interested in that the way we've, because we had this, this sort of issue once we got like our first big investment is okay so um well point one if there was any sort of agreement with the investor or whatever where you got the funds about what that was going to be used to that's already a very good um sort of uh roadmap to or a place to start your roadmap otherwise like ryan was saying like okay think to yourself like reverse engineer okay where do you want to be in one year or whatever this money takes you and then find write down a list of steps or, 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 or milestones that will get you there and start with the one that's going to bring you the closest. And then you'll see, because I mean, again, it depends on what you're building and, and, and what space you're in. Uh, but again, it's all about sort of proving that you have the right approach to it. So it's not about how many resources you have, but how resourceful you are with your resources. So how, much, how is that money going to go the farthest? How is that going to, because then if you can show a good use of the money, that's a magnet for more funds to come in later. Thank you. Hilati, maybe try to, to be very clear on how you would know that you had succeeded that milestone. So is it really that you need features in your product that, are, that you cannot go faster if you don't build them? Is it that you really need to reach more clients and prove that you can scale? Uh, what is the priority and how would you know that it's achieved? And then maybe that's where you have to, to invest first. Okay. But this is always a learning curve. And being retros doing constant retrospectives as well, um, understanding is it this the right way or should we stop and really understand if we have to shift maybe the, the priorities right now. Um, okay, if no one else jumps, uh, I think there's no raised hands here, uh, okay? Do let me know, do signs if you cannot uh, speak or just interrupt me, because uh, I'm- can I, can I ask something? Yes, go ahead, Pablo. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, so uh, my question is, so right now we are in a phase where we are raising seed capital for our MVP. So we have a pilot project uh, with Mexican partners. And we want to demonstrate that uh, this is scalable and uh, the business model works. So uh, I wonder if we can uh, involve an investor and like to put some money at the beginning for this pilot project and then condition, uh, him to put more money if we get some results for the pilot project. I'm not sure if I explained myself correctly, but... Like, um, for example, ask him to put like 
20,000 euros. And then if we get some results uh, to demonstrate the project is scalable, uh, he, like, he can put like five times uh, what he put at the beginning or something. I think. Is it, mm -hmm. No, sorry, go, go right. Oh, I, I guess my question is, is this something, uh, is this something they've proposed or is, is this a strategy to try to get interest in a new investment? Yeah, actually it's a strategy because for the pilot project, we cannot uh, ensure that we will uh, give his money back. Uh, but so we can uh, yeah, work uh, towards the phase two, which is when, when we start uh, getting our first cl uh, clients and uh, we can, you know, make uh, financial uh, projections more based on the, on the pilot project and on the KPS that we were testing the pilot project. Because right now it's difficult to make uh, financial projects or for projection for the first three years, for example. And this is someone that we want to, to test and to develop during the pilot project, which is during the next like six, seven months. So yeah, something like trying to involve the investor from this first phase and then like to get the support uh, from the start of the second phase. Thank you, Pablo. I mean, I, I think, uh, well, one, I think, I mean, it, it's, it's a good approach and, and it, typically where investors make their money is when they double down and you will see that, I mean, and this is true for individuals, but you will see that VCs kind of always do like a, or sometimes do a, like a small investment at first, and then if that goes well, where they will actually make money, uh, that it will be in, the, in their second investment, and it's kind of what you're describing at a larger scale. Um, I think, I mean, back to my point, be very honest about what you hope to achieve with these funds and what can happen and what your your vision is. I'm not a friend of projections at early stage, just because I mean that moment where you're going from when your baseline is zero. Uh, like you don't have anything, anything you will say is won't won't stand or hold. Like it's it's just a pure conjecture. Um, it's different if you already have some sort of revenue or baseline and you have some sort of trend. You can extrapolate some sort of trend no matter how small it is. Uh, but again, think about that they are investing in you and in the idea. So I would say the right the best way to do it, uh, if I were you, would be like be very clear on what milestone you're going to achieve with those twenty thousand or with this pilot, and what will happen if it goes well, and what need and what can and also be very clear of what can go wrong, and then also be very clear of if this happens, I will need this much more. Can I count on you to do that? Because also the experience of sort of being ashamed or 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 like shy to to ask for the money when you know you're going to need it and suddenly the moment comes where you need it and it's going to make or do uh, people take time to make decisions so the more time you give them to make decisions and the better position you're going to be the, the one caveat i'd put on there in terms of business projections is is i think that makes that's definitely you know oftentimes the case for startups if you're you know opening a line of pizza chains that's, I think when you look more like a small business than a startup, that's when it does make sense to do projections. Um, whereas with a startup, it's like, well, this is a gigantic market and we want to capture all of it. I don't know if I'm, you know, I don't know what it's going to look like in three months. Um, so it depends on your use case there. There's someone here. Yeah, I have one more. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. For sure, for sure. No worries. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So I, I think there is, very important that the team no? and that they do as a, as a person and as a professional. But what if, if uh, in your current team, you know that there is a lack of very important skills that they will be needed for to scale up the project? What, what if currently there are only like two or three people, but you know that we, you will need in the upcoming months uh, someone that takes care of something that you don't have experience or how, how, how will you deal with this? And I'd say that the, 
the reason why people look at teams so closely at early stage is because there's an absence of results or, or proof. So if you're missing that person that you think is key, um, you have to really be able to show what you've achieved so far or how you're going to achieve it without that person. Again, if you need it, maybe the conversation should be more towards uh, sort of, can you help me find this person or your investment will help us get this profile within the team. Um, I think from, I mean, I think Ryan maybe uh, will have additional color on this uh, with an engineering background. Uh, but in, in, in our sense, that's one of the things they told us. Like, and, and we, and by the way, we didn't have that. We didn't think we were missing anyone, but our investors seem to think like you guys could do with a more uh, technical profiles. So there, our focus was, uh, look, we've achieved this much without the technical profile, and this is how we have solved for that deficiency, if you can call it that. Um, so it's all about sort of, again, storytelling and, and how, you, how you phrase it. The messaging is, is really key at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the question is, are you thinking about it from a <clears throat> investors assessing your team profile or just like, I have a hiring need? Um, so, I mean, if you're looking for someone to kind of join the team to fill something really specific, you know, one, one piece of advice I've heard, which I think is good, is be generous with equity, but, but frugal with cash. Um, so bringing them on with the idea of like, hey, look, we're, you know, sell them, to, sell them into the idea. We don't have a lot of money, but I really want to make you a part of this team. Um, whereas I think when you, you have to be a lot more careful with someone who, you know, is more like you, you said three or four people that starts to become a big co-founding team. Um, then you have to think a lot more about, okay, is this the person I want to essentially marry as a co-founder? So I think it depends on, on what role you're trying to recruit for. And Pablo, maybe you can think also about how investors can also bring this expertise. So is, can this investor kind of mentor you as well? Uh, can you use the investment to, to get this person that you need as a team and not as a co-founder maybe? Um, so a lot of things that you can also put into the table uh, on the spot. Um, I'm very happy with the questions. I think these are exactly the common uh, places where we all are when, when we start. I know Andres also has his uh, hand raised. Hello, Andres. Yes. Hello. Hello, Hello everyone. Um, yes, I would have two questions. The first one, uh, would you, both of you, would you recommend uh, in case there is like a big company in the sector you are tackling that would be interested in uh, investing in your project uh, because it is a, a good idea and uh, they could be interested somehow, uh, would you recommend to, to depend in this type of uh, funding uh, for the project, or maybe it is too risky uh, due to, I don't know, uh, like, uh, well, the, the ideas uh, could, could be taken or, or maybe, yeah, they, they can use uh, uh, your project for other purposes, I don't know. Um, and then secondly, a question maybe more for Pablo in this case, uh, because I don't know how it works in, in America, but in Spain, where I am, um, like one of the options is to go for public funding for uh, like public support uh, for startups. Um, I don't know if you have experience on this, if it is worth it to invest time and energy to go through all this uh, long path to, to, to request uh, these uh, public funds for startups. Uh, or it is better to go always for private uh, uh, options. Thank you. Andres, would you just like in 10 seconds to say uh, what, your, what you do and what your venture is because you have a very specific a trend actually uh, sector. So would you let, just like to, to tell them? Okay, yes. Uh, so uh, my project is also kind of a marketplace, is a digital platform for a very specific sector, refrigeration and air conditioning. So, and it will cover the whole uh, value chain, providing different digital uh, services to mainly to optimize the communication among the different uh, actors in this uh, value chain. Um, so that's why my first question was in, in that way, you know, because it is a sector where we have like big players uh, at the international level. And uh, our idea in which we want to apply, for example, blockchain technology for traceability of uh, products, 
um, could be of interest for some of these big players. No? So that's why maybe we could find uh, funds uh, coming from there. But I don't know if it is something really uh, recommendable, no? because in that case, I think we will depend uh, on, a, on a big monster and maybe that's, that's dangerous, I don't know. Thank you so much, Andres. Thank you. I mean, if, if there are, I, I got a little confused on the blockchain space. I think if there are a, cus, a potential customer, that's a, a great partnership to have, right? I mean, having worked at larger companies, I think we sometimes, I mean, I don't want to downplay it, but we overestimate the ability for large companies to copy a small startup in a sort of uncertain space. Uh, but if they are, you know, it sounded like you're talking to a potential investor who is kind of tying you to a technology, you know, if you get invested, did you say blockchain? Did I hear you correctly? If you, if you tie yourself into, a, you know, get investment from consensus or, who, you know, whoever the big blockchain players are, and they say, well, now you have to build your platform on blockchain, that's a very big marriage that you're going to have to think about if it actually fits your product and brand. I mean, from my side, uh, we've kind of done that. So that first, I mentioned the uh, competition that sort of got us started was with a large real estate company uh, with CBRE and sort of we kind of grown along with this organization, although we're, we're not with them now per se. Um, like I would say one, in terms of anything related with intellectual property, it's always good to invest in having a good NDA right so under an nda and if they sign it that kind of gives you free roam to pick their brains talk and everything i think you will find and i'm not familiar with the space but in my experience corporates are uh, very interested in knowing what's going on especially if it's something more disruptive so they will be very very happy to have a, a healthy debate or conversation around this uh, and then also um, explore to see, I mean, most companies are now developing, especially if they're large ones, uh, venture arms and, and research uh, teams. So uh, try and do your research and see if they have any of that. And that could be a good point of contact, especially because it already uh, sets the expectation that you are there for an investment partnership or, or something, something like that. To your question about public funding, we, ha I mean, I think it's a great thing. And I think that it's often underutilized, uh, specifically with Spain. I think there's some great things like, um, I don't know if you've looked into uh, the CDTI. So uh, my only comment there is, and I've heard some horror stories about this and, and, and thank God we're not one of them, is beware of any intermediary that offers to manage the process for you because they will ask you for a lot of money, uh, no guarantees, and mostly you have to pay up front. So it's always worth investing in sort of these processes yourself. It's time consuming and you have to decide to make that time commitment, but any sort of non-dilutive um, sort of source of funding, uh, and, and I'm sure, I mean, uh, Ryan will, will probably agree to this, is, is, is great, is, is a godsend. Uh, again, just make sure that you don't rely on it uh, too much because you won't be able to control the timings and uh, for example now in Spain uh, I think there's a lot of cases where because there's a political impasse there's nothing being approved so if there's nothing being approved you're just waiting there and you still have to eat every month and you can't just wait for that public funding so again I'd say well used it's super useful don't count on it too much unless you have some degree of certainty that you're going to get it or if you're well into some sort of process or program. Um, and to piggyback off that a sec is a lot, there's a lot of niche pitch competitions. Um, you know, I've, I've been in a couple one, you know, some random small county competition that I was living in. Um, and, you know, it being a big fish in a small pond, if you have a great story, you know, if there happens to be HVAC, you know, pitch competitions or, or whatever, um, it's very easy to rise the top in, this, in the small pool. So keep an eye out for those. Andres, just a little comment on that as well, um, because you also, you can apply to a lot of funding that comes from the EU and green economy. Um, it is true what, what Pablo is saying, and I also have this personal experience. It is very time consuming. It is a heavy process. You never know what's going to happen. Sometimes you have to invest a lot up front and you don't really know when the funds are going to be available. So you have to be very careful with the process. But it is true that 
there are very different profiles of this kind of funding as well. There are impact bonds, there are um, partnerships with social investors. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do here. And um, I would keep investigating because there are new things coming out again now that uh, Horizon 2020 is also here. So um, this might, in your specific case, uh, you might find interesting uh, things here. Just never be completely dependent, as Pablo was, was saying. I totally, I totally agree. Uh, maybe we can also discuss that a little bit more. Okay, um, I want to be very mindful of anyone's time. Ryan, were you going to say anything? Sorry. Oh, okay. I want to be very mindful um, of everyone's time. So I don't know if anyone wants to share a last question. Uh, I don't see any hands here. I don't, want, I don't know. So just interrupt me if you remember a question now. But meanwhile, I wanted to ask you uh, guys, uh, Ryan and Pablo, is there any key habits that you maintain while doing this? Because I know how discouraged this can be. We learn a lot from our rejection and from our mistakes, for sure. I think we learn more from the rejections and the no's than from the success stories, for sure. Um, is there anything that you always have as a habit or, or, the, um, or you would like to know when you're, face, when you're following up on a, on a meeting with, a, with an investor? Uh, you know, I mean, knowing when to stop, knowing how to get feedback, strategic feedback, and learning from, from this experience? Ryan, maybe? <laughs> oh, um, oh, I had, a, you know, I had a whole other set of stay healthy, go outside, uh, but, but specifically <laughs> from, a, from an investment perspective. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, just follow up promptly, make sure you have your story down, don't get discouraged by no's, um, but also under, I, I would, after every meeting, understand what they were looking for, because I think you start to see patterns and you, it helps you craft your story based on the questions they ask. Thank you. My side and, and, and riffing off that, I, one thing I'd say is, so two things. You should go into every meeting knowing once what you want to get from that meeting. And even though like when you go in, suddenly things are completely different uh, and it, it's, whole different conversation than you thought it was going to be. It's always good to have a goal, like never walk into a meeting, just like, oh, see what happens. See, what, like, who, who is that? Um, uh, always try and have an agenda, even if it's in your head. Um, and secondly, write everything down. I mean, to Ryan's point, write down what questions you get asked, write down what responses you give. Uh, you would be, so in the past couple of weeks, as part of the accelerator program, I think in 10 days, we have over 90 meetings. Um, there is like, I don't care how smart you are. There is no way that you're going to be able to leverage that just off memory. So we developed like a whole database of like meeting notes and questions that were asked and everything. And you may be writing the same thing down a thousand times, but even that should be a signal to you of, okay, why is this coming up so many times? How do we change this? Um, and also like, I'm a big believer in having like your own personal or, or corporate, uh, database of knowledge. Uh, and keep it up to date and keep it, um, yeah, no, writing it down. And, and one last thing, because I feel like we gave you very clinical advice. Um, be excited about what you're working on, even if you don't feel excited that day. Um, and, and, under, and understand kind of the spine of your message and why this will make a real difference in, in someone's life. And if you can sort of riff off that and get energy from that and talk about this as if really this can make a fundamental difference, that can cover up a whole lot of, of other stuff because the investors will also feel the same excitement. Yeah. I mean, if you're not excited about your, what you're doing in your product, no one else will be. A hundred percent. Thank you so much for adding that guys. Um, so maybe I'll close up with asking you, uh, to give you, to give you a little moment to also talk about what you're, what you're doing and, and the success you've been having. Uh, what's next, uh, what's next with, with Addicts, with, with Waypos, with, with the projects that you have ongoing, Pablo, maybe do you want to go? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're still within the accelerator program until mid December, uh, but we're very excited. We have two pilots going on, uh, in one in Europe and one in North America. Uh, we're moving the company here, as I mentioned, from Spain to Toronto. So that's also uh, very exciting. Uh, a lot of sort of new experiences, moving people, hiring people and stuff. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, we're doing much better than we, we thought we would, which we're very skeptical about. 
to be fair, and I'm sort of the more paranoid person within within the team. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're as I said, we're launching our part, like our final our MVP next week, which is going to be sort of the basis of the pilots. Uh, and excited to sort of document how it does on the field, and sort of, and you'll see. I think if you follow us, you'll see that we'll be releasing a lot of the content um, regarding sort of our our area and also the, the experience, like the meta experience as a startup of like how do we, how do you face a pilot? Because this is the first time we're doing a pilot in, in our history, and like no one in the company has ever done one. So, uh, to my point of writing things down, I think you you you'll do more let's say uh, useful and, and sort of intelligent writing when you think someone else is going to be reading it. So you'll see some content coming out from us. Uh, but yeah, we're super excited. And so uh, if you guys are, are ever in Toronto or, or whatever, you have any tips on, on the region, uh, let us know. And, and by the way, if, I mean, I don't know if you have my details, but if you find me on LinkedIn, whatever, I'm pretty good at responding to people. So if you have any questions that uh, you want to ask offline, please feel free. That's great, Ryan. Yeah, yeah uh, we're a little, we're you know, we're a little earlier stage in that, and I realize I didn't explain exactly what we did. Um, so I mean, uh, so a big problem if you've ever freelanced, I'm sure at least a few of you have, is getting clients to pay on time, right? You send out the invoice, it's 30 days pass, and uh, maybe they pay you in 30 days, maybe they don't. Um, and that's a gigantic issue, especially kind of you see, you're seeing this evolution of the gig economy where people are realizing that protections actually need to be put in place for these freelancers and re regulations and sort of um, sentiment is anticipating that. Uh, we're a larger organization that freelancers can bill through um, and we can pay them instantly, right? And we actually cover a lot of the billing for them. And as a bigger organization, we can help um, do that enforcement and make sure they actually get paid um, according to contract. Uh, so that's that's what we're working on. Uh, we're in later start, stage talks with an accelerator, uh, finishing up an MVP to to push out to our freelancer side, as well as exploring if there are ways to get in on the client side as well. Um, so really exciting things happening on that front, and uh, excited to keep you all uh, apprised of that. Wow! And they estimate that around I've read it somewhere, eighty percent of the world population will be well, of the working population, sorry, will be freelancers in the next decade. So that's huge. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, guys, I cannot thank you enough because uh, this was very generous. Uh, I love the interaction from everyone. Uh, I didn't want to extend it too much also to be mindful of, of everyone. And, and also both you, Ryan and Pablo, you're starting your day <laughs> where you are in the side of the planet. Um, this is a never ending topic. As I was saying, we could dig into the subtopics that we have, uh, that we have discussed here. Um, I'm very happy. I hope it was uh, enjoyable and useful to all of you. And I wanted to show you before we leave, uh, because we Bridge for Billions, we have this competition going on. Um, Andres actually was a winner from a previous competition we, we had, uh, the cohort. Uh, Ryan also uh, was involved. And um, we have recently revamped the challenge. Uh, so we have the Leap Pitch Challenge, uh, which will now be biannual and we'll uh, basically uh, our alumni startups can participate uh, we want to reach more visibility share more resources with you um, and the live event to with the five final finalists moving to the to the 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 live event that will present the pitch to a jury uh, will be next Tuesday so I would invite you all to participate I wanted, because I had some problems, I had to have this uh, this way, but now I can show you a little video if it works. Yes. Um, and so I invite you all to participate. We have a web page with a link, with everything we will show in the community, we'll show in, in our social media. But basically, uh, I want you to invite to support our entrepreneurs participating uh, and to tell us about your, your stories moving forward. As you see, both, uh, well, other people in this, uh, in this session as well, but Ryan uh, and Pablo were both uh, in incubation. They, they ended up a few, they, they concluded a program a few months ago, and now we're hosting a session with them. We really want to hear your stories. Uh, this is why we have this community as well. Uh, success stories, failure stories, mistakes, learning. So all of that, this is what it is uh, to be an entrepreneur, to restart, share, help each other and move, and move forward. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. 
we will share the recording in case you want to recap and take all the notes uh, as Pablo was saying earlier. Uh, and we invite you to share with us uh, about ideas for future sessions, things you would like to discuss, what you would like to hear from the community. As you know, we're open to, to all of that. Uh, so I have to wish you now a wonderful day to all of you. And I hope this was very useful. We were very happy to, to have you here today. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much Thank for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan.